Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Artists. My name is Rachel Wilkins. I am delighted to have you join us here this morning. Super excited about my guest this morning, Philip A. Robinson, Jr. Philip, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good to be here. Happy Thursday to everybody. Absolutely. So, Philip, you are an educator, and we are delighted to be joined by some of your students from the Grace Church School this morning. It's the seventh grade studio art class. So let's just give a little shout out to uh, to the students. Yeah, we'll see if uh, a couple of them may come into the group. Our class actually starts at 1125, so we're still going. They'll okay. be here. But uh, some of them may be joining early. If they don't have a class, they know that you know they can come on in. So how is that homeschooling uh, going? That idea of being the teacher from a distance how is how are you navigating that uh it's actually quite fun uh you know we've changed up things uh, from what we were trying to do uh with the rest of the curriculum but uh a lot of the stuff has stayed the same so we just wrapped up um some of our peter callison uh projects with the seventh grade the eighth graders are working on their individual projects from home um so we're starting to get some feedback from that We've kind of narrowed our classes down to 30 minutes. So for those 30 minutes, we're just doing critiques, you know, going mm. round table discussion about what works, what doesn't work. Um, and it's really helping them, especially for next year when they go on to the upper school or high schools, being more independent about their own work, um, which they're gonna to have to do when they get to the collegiate level. Mm. Awesome. How would you say being an educator has perhaps Im influenced or impacted you creatively? Um, it really uh, allowed me to go back to my own upbringing and think about, you know, how and when I started to learn about the materials that I was uh, getting into. And for me, um, it really resonated with the fact that sometimes with certain teachers, you only get into certain um, materials later on down the line. So for instance, like maybe foam, sometimes we didn't get into foam until you know, almost school was ending. So I try and really touch on the materials a lot earlier. And if we've broached one material already, I try to give them something new so we never duplicate. So we might have uh, 2D or perspective one time and the next time we're doing uh, cardboard, other time we're doing foam, we're doing some watercolors, we're doing some wood. Uh, so it's always varied so that, you know, the, the students are able to um, kind of learn the material at an earlier age. Because what I've found is that if you've, just like a language, if you've mastered the material at a certain age, then you then can you know, uh, express yourself uh, through the medium. You don't have to worry about trying to figure out how the medium works, you already know that. So you know, the earlier we can get to it, the better. Hmm. So I wanna talk a little bit about medium because you, you, your choices in medium are certainly quite unique. Um, I read that you favor uh, going to a wood mill in Woodstock as opposed to going to the art store to get your material. So tell us about that. How did that come about? Yeah, um, I, you know, when I left graduate school and I was working primarily with uh, metal, I didn't have, you know, the facilities to really work in or the ventilation or the, the machines. Um, at that time, the machines for, you know, the price of a plasma cutter was really expensive. The price has gone down now, but even then, you know, find the ventilation and the areas to work. So I had to find another medium to work in that I could still fulfill my my endeavors. And so I went on to wood. And so I've been working in wood for the past, you know, shoot, almost 10, 12 years now. Um, and in doing so, you know, I've, I've kind of worked at different, different types of woods, trying to find the best areas, the, the places where they're not so expensive, because, you know, hard wood can be really expensive. So, um, you know, a lot of the work, and you see some of the pieces back here, like that walnut, uh, you know, it's, you gotta go out and try and find it, you know, uh, different, you know, every, every piece of wood is different. So when I'm creating my ideas or my projects, I need to have a surplus of material that I could look to and say, all right, this would work for this piece or that would work for this one. And sometimes it takes me a couple of years to see that vision come to life because I don't have the wood or don't have the right material for it. So. I go up to Woodstock um, to get some pieces. I actually made a run yesterday to uh, Central Jersey to get some wood uh, from a friend of mine, um, and you know, stock up as much as I can because the work's got to be produced. So, what is the? I'm so intrigued by the process. Do you have kind of an intent 
before you go up to this wood mill? Do you, do you know what you're looking for or do you just kind of go with it and see what pieces you find and then perhaps conceptualize the ideas for the pieces from there? Which one is it or is it, does it vary? Yeah, um, a little bit of both. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I've, over the course of years, I've been collecting pieces of wood. Um, I try to find stuff that has a certain grain to it or a different look to it, um, different colors, different textures. When I was working with uh, my Untitled Faces series, and a lot of people are familiar with that series, you know, in terms of dealing with uh, facial features and skin tones, I needed to have a wide range of wood to use that I could, you know, pick and choose which ones I wanted. Um, so when you know you're thinking about that, you want to think about the light and darks in certain areas, where the shadows hitting in certain areas. So if you look back at those pieces, you'll see where I have, you know, cut certain parts of that wood out so that you can see the shadow undertones of some of the cheekbones um, and the forehead, where the lights kind of bouncing off the forehead uh, and utilizing the grain to my advantage, whether the grain is going horizontal or vertical, uh, showing some of those pieces. So in order to do that, I got to have a surplus. So like if I go out, I may get like five to six, six to seven different pieces of wood, uh, all different colors and take it back and keep it inside. Uh, you know, my, my wife, God bless her soul, she uh, has had to put up with all this wood all around the house for a long time. So now I kind of have a semi studio that I made outside in my backyard with a shed. So uh, a lot of that wood is back there that I can go through and rummage through and see what I can use. Now you've had a, a bit of a life shift lately. You just uh, recently had a, a baby, a daughter, I believe. Yeah, Vivian James Robinson. Yep. Oh, well, well congratulations, first of all. Um, I was thrilled to see, I think that's the youngest baby that we've ever had a, a conception show. Um, <laughs> when you went, went up to get the award and we just saw this tiny, beautiful little baby, we we're like, we, this baby has to get up there with you and be a part of this moment. How is your, um, are you still finding that you're able to you be creative with just such a major life shift and you know a, a new environment in your in your home life yeah it's interesting you know the timing of everything i'm a, i'm a true believer that you know everything happens for a reason mm -hmm. and really right when she was born uh, a lot of things started to happen for me uh business wise as well as shows and galleries um and so i've been quite busy um and a new series kind of started to come about um during that time period as well. Uh, but I think the biggest change for me has been timing, you know, coming up with the schedule because uh, beforehand I had time to just, you know, if I felt the creative juices coming on that I could take my time and spend four or five hours in the studio and knock that out. And I just don't have the time for that anymore. You know, where, um, uh, let me amend that and say, I had the time for it, but I have to find the time within the day. So, uh, you know, finding time to, to do work and uh, you know teach all of my classes and then uh cooking meals and uh you know being with my daughter and spending time with my wife um as well as trying to find time to get into the studio so it's kind of been an arranging of uh periods where you know after the day i try and put in at least three hours two hours and doing some type of uh work in the studio whether it be just you know sketching some things in the dining room or uh, you know, changing outfits and going out into the to the studio to get you know a ton of sawdust on me, whatever mm. it may be. So take us through the process. So once you've actually got these pieces, you've gone to the wood mill and you have kind of you know this assemblage of varying types of wood and textures. What does that process look like? Is there a sculpture sculpture involved, or is it more of an assemblage um, approach? Talk us through that. Yeah, good question. Um, so where I'm at right now, I'm working on this series um, that will hopefully start to uh, come about within the next couple of months where uh, it's using the same idea. So I, it, it, my sketches are usually um, done with paper and an X-Acto knife. And so that allows me to kind of chop and screw the negative and positive space that I want to use. The, and you can see here with this piece behind me, you can see that idea of that negative and positive space um, so I use the X-Acto blade um, to kind of choose what I want within my sketches. And then I take that and transfer, you know, enlarge it and transfer it to, um, to the wood, which allows me then to cut out the different parts of the wood to kind of piece it together, almost like a puzzle. 
Um, so that's kind of the process that I've been pursuing for really the past uh, eight or nine years uh, in regards to the wood. Um, and it, it's gotten me to the point now where I'm really looking at um, being able to go back to my metal aspect and combine more of the metal back into the wood, um, less of cutting out, but more of, you know, applique, um, whether it be in the background or foreground. Here with this piece here, you can see the uh, this figure of Pooh holding up this almost like mirror-like substance where he's looking at his own reflection uh, in the mirror. And that's kind of where I'm headed towards now. Hmm. What do you feel that wood gives you um, that perhaps other materials cannot? And what, what are the challenges that come with working with such a uh, really unforgiving material? Yeah. Uh, my uncle um, who passed away, his name was Ed Martin. He used to be um, a marble sculptor. And mm. so, you know, I knew him when he only did marble, but he always would remind me that there is a process to it. So you start with uh, the most forgiving substance, which is ceramics and clay. Mm. And you go from clay, essentially you can go into foam. If you don't have foam, you go straight to wood, which is a little more forgiving. And then from the wood, eventually you go into different types of stone. Stone, you go into sandstone, and eventually the hardest stone, which is marble. So um, while marble is really less forgiving, um, that if you you know you're carving through it, a chunk falls off, you could put it back together um, or deal with you know whatever the marble is giving you. The same idea is with the wood, where it's still a hard substance, but it's alive. You know, wood. Um, unless you take the moisture all the way out of the wood by taking it to be dried in kilns, you're constantly dealing with the warping and moving of wood. If you are combining different elements of the wood together, you have to make sure that the uh, grain of the wood is going in opposite directions. Otherwise you'll have more warping. So you have to be constantly vigilant about that. Um, and as well as, you know, the idea of wood in and of itself, even though it's a hard substance, um, it's very pliable. You know, you can mold it into what you want. So uh, this time that I spent with the wood has been about, you know, really using it to my advantage and seeing what I can get away with and what I can't, which is why I need the huge surplus of wood in order to, you know, I can't force a piece to be what it's not. Have there been any moments where you've been so close to perhaps completing a piece and then you've made a wrong move as you know, so many of us have done with our artwork and you've had to kind of go right back to, to the beginning. Uh, again, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So if something, if, if something breaks off or if I make a wrong cut, right, there were no wrong decisions. So it was supposed to be broken off. It was supposed to be cut. The piece has to change uh, because that's not how it's supposed to be. Uh, there have been times where I've started to do things and it's not looked like it was posted or it wasn't going the way I wanted it to. I just put it down. You know, I put it down and come back to it, you know, days later, months later. I need to walk by it. I need to breathe it in. I need to look at it um, to really get a better idea of how I need to make my changes. Um, because it's really, you know, to quote, you know, Nipsey Hussle, it's really a, a marathon, you know, where... Mm -hmm. We're not in this for, you know, the sprints. We're in this for, you know, the long term, not the short term goal. So uh, I'm not going to put out something out into the world, especially to my audience and viewers that I don't think uh, really stands, uh, not only will stand the test of time, but also is a, a, a testament of what I'm trying to say within my work. So what are you trying to say within your work? Um, Right I know that's now, a, lo a yeah, loaded question, <laughs> many answers, but on a, on a really kind of basic fundamental level, what do you hope that people get when they experience your work? What do you hope they experience? Uh, a spiritual, a certain level of spirituality, uh, a certain level of context uh, within time. Um, I want them to be able to uh, see themselves within the work whether it be something from a young age or something that they've encountered now. Um, I want them to look at the work um, and, and, and take something away from it that is meaningful to them. Um, I remember a time when I was with my aunt and my mother 
Um, and I used to go to the Guggenheim and the Met and all these museums. And the one thing that my aunt always reminds me is I was asked, well, why is this art? Why is this on the wall? You know, how did they get to be there? Why, why is this like the, the main thing that we need to be looking at? And so, uh, you know, my purpose has really been to kind of be a voice for, um, for some of the representation that we don't see in the historical canon. Um, mm -hmm. We started to see a lot more of that now uh, with Amy uh, Cheryl and her work. Uh, we started to see with Derek Adams and his pieces, Hank Lewis Thomas and his work. Um, where we're really getting a, a, a glimpse of life um, in the, not only just the African-American community, but uh, people of color and their stamp on, um, you know, the historical canon that is the art world. So, you know, it's uh, being a person of color uh, and being a man of color, it's really uh, almost like a, a secondary job that, you know, if I'm producing work, I need to have an understanding of who my viewers are and how they are interacting with the work. What are some of the surprising or rewarding moments that you've had with your audience? Uh, there was one that uh, happened at 14C, which is a, a, a gallery uh, exhibition in Jersey City. It's the second year that we've been running it. Uh, it's run out of the Hyatt downtown Jersey City. Um, there was a child uh, I wasn't there to witness this. I was sent videos and, and pictures, but the child actually went up to one of my pieces and started to mimic what it was. And what it was was an image of a man um, with his arms kind of raised up in a muscular format, but you only saw the back of this individual. And so they're asking him, you know, well, which is your favorite piece? And he just immediately was going into these muscular forms. Um, and so for whatever, um, you know, for whatever it was, it really hit him home about that particular piece. Um, so seeing stuff like that really lets me know that I'm on the right path with my work. Um, you know, here is a child that really saw himself within the work, whether it be through color of the wood, whether it be through uh, the muscles that just happened to be on this individual. Uh, you could actually see yourself through this piece. Um, the, the piece was entitled What Has Been Can Never Be Undone. Uh, I think it's part three. Uh, so if anyone's interested in checking that out, you can look it on my website. Uh, but, um, you know, seeing the interaction of, you know, the people, young, old, different generations, seeing the work and taking different pieces away uh, is really impactful for me. How does that feel emotionally to know that you can have that impact, especially on such a young mind? Uh, it feels great. It feels great. Um, it it gives me confirmation that what I'm doing is not um, it's not a fad. It's not you know. I, I, for for us artists, you know, this really is an obsession for us. Those those that are really into it. Uh, if you think about it, yep. we we obsess over this. We sleep this. We eat this. We drink this. Um, and uh, you know, I'm dealing with doing some questions now um, with in regards to um, residencies and proposals. And one of the questions was asked is about craft. You know, how do you see this craft? Well, I don't see my work as craft. You know, I see my work as fine art. And so that's always been the struggle as well is to um, kind of put wood and the, the idea of wood back in the conversation of fine art. Uh, and hold the same way, I believe it does, hold the same weight as some paintings, you know, um, and sculpture and kind of bring sculpture back around. So to see the interactions that people are having with these works, um, even though, you know, they're still wall-based or three-dimensional, three they're relief sculptures, I call my work sculpture. Um, but, you know, that also goes into maybe I need to start to rethink some of the ideas. But again, going back, you know, just uh, seeing the reactions is, is everything for me. Huh. So you uh, got a BA in uh, studio art and then got your master's at uh, Mason Gross uh, in, in sculpture. What do you feel that that kind of level of schooling did for you? And do you think that as somebody who seems to have a lot of heart in their work, do you feel that that perhaps either developed or maybe hindered your artistic voice? 
That's a complicated question. <laughs> I like to ask complicated questions. <laughs> uh, it's very layered. Um, let me preface that by saying this, that I don't believe that college is for everyone, mm. but I believe that there is a college for everyone. Mm. Great and answer. So, um, I think it, it really behooves the individual to find the right place for them. Um, when I graduated from Skidmore, um, I almost, well, looking back on it, I almost left Skidmore because I didn't think it was the right place for me my first freshman year. Um, I came into it and really came out of it with a lot of information. I learned how to weld there. I learned how to use a plasma cutter there. Uh, I learned, uh, you know, how to use the wheel, how to do ceramics. Uh, I learned wood there. Um, so I would not have gained that if I had not gone to uh, that institution. Um, in terms of Mason Gross, uh, at the time at which I graduated from undergrad, my mother passed uh, in that same year. And so um, before she had, she was saying that I should go to graduate school and I really didn't see the need for it. I didn't want to go to graduate school. Um, I was like, more schooling, I'm done with it. I'm not, you know, I, I barely got through undergrad. I don't know if I really want to do that process again. And she, what she was saying was that, and she was a college professor um, at Sarah Lawrence, uh, Dr. Regina Arnold. And what she was saying was that, uh, you know, graduate school is a totally different entity. Whereas, you know, undergrad, you're trying to figure out what you want to do and where you want to go. Graduate school is you can really hone in on your craft and really focused on what it is you want to pursue in life. And so, uh, you know, I looked at all different types of schools. I looked at Yale, I looked at Columbia. Um, we actually, before she passed, we went to go, you know, see these schools and went to go to the studios. And I really fell in love with Mason Gross. Um, I loved the campus down in uh, New Brunswick. It was a lot of open air, it was similar to Skidmore. Um, a lot of space, a lot of studio stuff. They had a plasma cutter, they had uh, welding torches and things like that. And so uh, I wound up, you know, spending my time there and met some really amazing people that are still my friends today. Uh, Heather Hart, who is an amazing artist. Uh, she's now back at Rutgers working as a, a professor there. Um, I met Wanda uh, Ortiz, who is an amazing uh, artist. She does a lot of, of theater in her work. Um, I also met uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, who, uh, for those of you who know, is an amazing photographer, um, and has done some uh, you know wonderful things. And she actually was the curator there at Mason Gross. So if I had not gone through them uh, at Mason Gross, I wouldn't have met these connections uh, that mm -hmm. I really you know use now within my practice and, and you know bounce ideas off of and have really helped form my network of, of friends and family. Um, but I think it's important for, you know, for you to find your place in some of these institutions and now being a, you know, being a teacher myself, uh, it's one thing I always tell my students that it's great, but you need to really prepare yourself for the outside bubble. Uh, that is the real world, you know, are you ready? You know, if you're really trying to pursue art as a career, um, that's great that you understand the creative side of it, but what about the business side? That's also something that you need to take in mind. And I hear often from folks that have gone and, you know, I, I did not go to art school, but anybody who went through either, you know, a BA or an, or an uh, MFA, there is barely anything about art business, right? That's, that's uh, a part of those, those courses. Do you think right. that we have a responsibility to um, perhaps make better decisions? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you see the hunger for people that, you know, artists that want to get involved, not only with Conceptions Arts, but uh, with artists in the workplace, uh, in the city. You know, once you really get knee deep in it, uh, and you understand that, you know, the art world really is a business, you need to understand the value that you have for yourself. And, you know, you need to surround yourself with a team that's going to help you really get to the next level, you know, mm -hmm. getting into galleries and exhibition spaces, uh, pricing your work out accordingly, uh, make sure that you're being aware of percentages taken out um, mm -hmm. by other galleries and exhibition spaces, uh, doing the legwork of getting into residencies and other applications, 
uh, being able to stomach the rejections, which is a huge part, you know, of the process. You know, being Not able to exactly don't take it personal, <laughs> but being able to learn from the experience and ask questions. You know, yeah. uh, sometimes you don't get much feedback from uh, the rejection letters, but you know, send that extra letter in and ask. You know. I, I appreciate your feedback. Uh, you know, any other feedback that you would offer me at this time is welcomed. I really appreciate, you know, this within my practice. Uh, a lot of that goes a long way, mm -hmm. uh, but you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, we're not taught taxes in undergraduate school, right? Like we're not taught uh, mortgage and, and, you know, how to sustain a business and how to ask for a loan, like all these things that would really behoove uh, individuals coming out of you know, these institutions with huge amounts of debt, you know, mm -hmm. that's the only thing that's guaranteed for a lot of us when we graduate. So um, I always try to give that to my students in terms of having them understand the other side of it. And even though I'm doing, you know, currently teaching third, seventh and eighth, I've taught K through 12, but mm -hmm. I even try to give, you know, my third graders an idea that, you know, the same drawing or painting or, or photo that you're creating here is no different than the one that you'll see at the New York Times or the one that you'll see you know, in different magazines or uh, on, on TV or other media outlets. You know, the difference is how they were able to get there and a true belief in themselves. But let me also go back and say that I also believe that um, that you don't have to go to school to be successful. I know many individuals that have uh, achieved a certain level of success or their idea of success uh, without schooling. Um, you know, so it's really about drive. It's really about understanding what it is you're trying to pursue and, you know, having a plan of how you want to go about, you know, achieving that. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, it's not that there's a school for everyone, you know, that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the education itself, but finding your place, like finding your, the right place for you, where you'll be comfortable, where you can thrive. And I think one of the other things that's really important is that, we teach students how to advocate for themselves because once you get out there in the world and particularly the art world which can be a brutal place for somebody you know coming out confidently from art school and you know full of pride in their work to then go out and get that rejection which is so common I mean I experienced it myself like you know I literally had a door close to my face by one calorist so you know it's it's we, I think we we do have a responsibility to let those that are coming up, um, you know, the students that are coming out of school know that, it, you know, it doesn't matter. One person's opinion is not, you know, should not inform the rest of your creative career and that you can push and advocate and send the follow-up e emails. So much of, you know, the success that I had, and I don't know whether you can relate to this, but it came from the follow-up. It came from reaching back out to people and saying, hey, you know, pay attention or, hey, why did I not get this opportunity? And I think so many just take a, you know, a, a, if they don't get a response to an email or if they don't get a, perhaps, you know, a yes right away, they take that as that opportunity is done. So I'm, I'm definitely a big uh, supporter of, uh, you know, pushing those, those uh, boundaries and, you know, advocating for yourself, for sure. You have to, 100% have to. So on that note, galleries obviously serve a purpose, but the art world is changing very rapidly, especially given what we're dealing with right now, the pandemic. Do you still, what, what is kind of your big picture goal in terms of where you want your work to go? Do you see gallery representation in your future or do you feel that you might take a different path? Uh, a little bit of both. I'm actually working currently uh, with my team uh, with coming up with another way of kind of um, creating our own blueprint about how uh, success is supposed to look for uh, artists. And so um, we started to kind of start a dialogue about uh, what does that look like? Um, what shape is it going to take? How do we want to uh, put it out there into the world? And um, I'm kind of using myself as the guinea pig uh, for this endeavor. But the basic concept is, you know, we're trying to pushing back against what has 
always kind of been the the norm for artists, right? You're making work, you're uh, showing it to galleries and, and other places. Uh, you're trying to get noticed by the right people. Uh, you're going to you know all these um, exhibition spaces and uh, getting numbers and writing emails. Eventually, hopefully, you get picked up by somebody um, to get gallery representation. You know, eventually, hopefully, you do get into a gallery and you're selling work, but you're not seeing a lot of that money because they're taking a huge percentage out of your uh, pockets. Um, mm. And then, you know, eventually, hopefully, your work is being resold, but you're not seeing any of uh, that type of money because it's a resale. And so there's stuff already been in place um, and it's still happening where, you know, artists are starting to create almost like a thumbprint of their work. So if their work gets resold, they're seeing some of the royalties from that piece, which is great. Um, but I don't think it's enough. And so I've been working with my team to really try and find another way uh, that can put artists in the spotlight um, of the right people so that uh, people can really latch hold of that. I think we're really starting to see it um, with some of these programs on uh, Instagram, like Versus that Swiss Beats uh, and Timbaland have put together. Um, you know, they're reaching a huge amount of followers just from online uh, representation. And so the idea is, well, if, if Swiss Beats and, and Timberland can put out this Versus with songs, right? Well, then how can the visual artists put out their work uh, over social media and over streams? And so that's kind of where we're headed to. We're trying to figure out what that looks like, how that would be, um, and, and attach it to uh, music and attach it to video and attach it to all of these forms that really interact with your senses so that when you are seeing this work, um, it's really, you know, it's really pulling you in. You want to know more about the artist. You want to know more about their work. That it's not just tied to a particular gallery, you know, a white wall gallery base, but uh, that's great, but it's bigger than that. You know, it's bigger than the institution. It's bigger than, uh, you know, just one space. And that's kind of what we're seeing with music. So I want to be able to switch it. So we're seeing the same thing that we're seeing with these mixtapes with music. We're seeing it within the mixtape of the visual arts world. Everybody on Facebook and YouTube still here and see us? Drop us a little comment because it seems some reason. Uh, can you still okay, Philip? Uh, you're a little choppy on my computer, but I can see you well on Instagram. Okay. Okay. So we'll roll with it. Um, let me actually just take this opportunity to um, let you guys know that we will be taking some questions. Um, so Philip will be on hand to answer some questions at the top of this session. Uh, so if you do have any questions for Philip, I would pop them into the comments and we'll come back and read them at the end. Um, also, we are gonna put Phil's website right in the comments as well. So you can make sure that you can uh, go ahead and look up his beautiful work. And um, what else? Something else. Nope, totally forgot. <laughs> Might need more coffee. <laughs> so let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about the uh, the intent and the history and uh, just a little bit about your personal history as well. You are the son of a Cherokee and African mother and a, uh, a Trinidadian German father. How has your identity informed your creative practice and just your, your personal life in general? Yeah, uh, let me amend that to say that I actually, uh, that was an old uh, statement and I got some feedback from my father and my uncle about that. It was a Trinidadian and British uh, uh, grandfather, instead of German, it was British. And so um, I, that really just also hit home in terms of finding out more about my heritage and my family tree that um, a lot of us think we know, but we really, we don't know. We don't, I mean, really do the research for yourself. It's all hearsay from somebody telling you something else until you really dive into it. Um, but I have family that from down South, my uh, grandmother grew up in uh, Greenwood, South Carolina. Um, and my uh, 
my mother came from the South with my grandmother and then they moved up to Philadelphia where they live now. Uh, my father uh, in the city, uh, born in New York, and uh, he actually lives in Queens as well as um, Flint, Michigan currently. My mm -hmm. uh, grandfather um, who lives out in uh, Huntington right now, but he grew up in the city and actually was uh, one of the first African-American judges uh, in New York City. And so, um, you know, knowing this type of information really played a role, uh, not just in my upbringing, but uh, wanting to know more about the historical context. Um, the fact that my mother um, was a part Cherokee really played a role in a lot of uh, the ideas around the wood that I'm using now. Um, I've been dating all the wood that I'm using. And so by using a dental chronology, you can date uh, all the wood by looking at the ring. So if you have an understanding of how old some of this wood is, then you have an understanding of what was happening during the time period of this wood. Um, if you, I did a reverse migration tour with artist Abigail DeVille uh, a couple of years back and we went down to Savannah where if you go to some the trees down in Savannah, you can see where the uh, the whippings, where they used to whip uh, some of the African Americans down in Savannah, you can still see the whippings on the tree, you know? And so I think that really resonated with me, especially when I started doing a lot of my work um, with wood, is that, you know, the wood tells a story. It's telling us what has happened before. And so you know, if I'm sourcing my wood from upstate, then that would be the same area that, you know, my ancestors were there uh, foraging and, you know, using this wood for building homes, using this wood for trading because of its hard wood, you know, it's hard wood. So it had a certain amount of value uh, involved. And so all of that has really played a role in my work. Um, you know, my culture, my heritage, the timeline, the historical timeline between those that have come before me versus those that are here now. Um, and what's really interesting, actually, if you go on my page, you scroll all the way down my Instagram page, I actually have an image of my great grandfather who uh, actually was a printmaker uh, in Trinidad before mm -hmm. he came over, which I thought was really interesting, um, especially with them doing these pieces now. You know, I'm, I'm quite positive that he's speaking through me in some type of way spiritually as well. So, how do you take an experience as devastating as seeing those? those markets uh, work. You froze there's obviously it. such a, a heaviness and sadness to it. Yeah, you froze a little bit, uh, but what I uh, what I think you're saying is how do how do I contextualize uh, seeing those images of the scarring on the trees? Is that correct? Yeah. How do you take that into your work, or do you do you want your work to have that kind of sadness and he and heaviness to it? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to understand the historical timeline of things that have happened now versus things that are reoccurring. So. Um, in the series, what has happened? Uh, what has happened? Uh, well, excuse me. What has been uh, can never be undone. Um, I kind of go into that. That was based around um, uh, Prada, Gucci, and Montclair putting out the racist imagery in their clothing lines, um, and so uh, you have three individuals where you only see the backs of these figures. The first one has its arms outstretched uh, and you can see the two G's of Gucci, the emblem logo in the back of the figure. The second one is of uh, Montclair, which has the rooster and the M. Um, and you can see that in the back of that figure and that figure has its hands behind its back, almost like it's handcuffed, excuse me. And the third image, uh, has an image of uh, the Prada symbol of the triangle in the back of that figure. And his hands are in that, like I said, with the child with his hands in the muscular form. Um, within all three of these figures, the wood, which is walnut, is on uh, stainless steel, uh, mirror gray stainless steel. So you see yourself in the reflection of all these gaps and crevices. Um, and the logos aren't 
really, it's not identifiable until you really look within uh, the figures to see your reflection on it. Um, it's important to understand, uh, and there was, you know, the conversation between, well, you know, uh, Gucci and Prada Montclair, they all apologized. They all, uh, you know, said it was an intentional and, um, you know, there was a huge discussion through celebrities alike that, you know, asking, well, when is it okay to continue to wear the clothing? And, uh, well, they apologize, so I don't understand what the big deal is. And I actually had this conversation with uh, a curator about that, where she was asking, um, you know, she saw the works and she was asking, well, when is it okay? You know, they all apologize. You know, when is it okay for this to continue to wear the clothing? And um, my response to her, uh, knowing her uh, ethnicity and race, uh, was asking if, you know, what kind of car did she drive? Um, or which she said, you know, uh, uh, an American made car. And I asked her, will she ever drive a, a Mercedes, a German car? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I would never do that. And I said, I, well, it, it's kind of the same idea, right? That you know what's happened historically, um, you know, whether you, know, you want to separate the brand from uh, uh, the individual. Um, but I think, you know, people still need to be accounted for and held accountable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in seeing, in doing this reverse migration with Abigail um, and seeing, you know, the markings on the trees, um, and going to the plantations that are still open and running, and still collecting money from tourists, um, and still have people working in the fields because they still have uh, people of color, whether it be Mexicans or or uh, Latinas or Latinos. Um, you know, still working because they have honey crops down there. So they're still working the fields and the honey crops and they're still getting money. Um, you know, seeing all these things, it stays with you. And I think until you kind of see these things in person, you can't really have a true understanding of why it's important that you, you know, that, you know, you need to still highlight these aspects. You know, people kind of just whitewash this. Oh, it's a one thing deal. Like, these things have been happening for years, but you know, either you don't remember or you want to forget, you know, and I think it's important for our youth, especially with me dealing with uh, my students, that it's important that they know, they understand, you know, what has happened so that they can make a change. Yeah, uh, I had the wonderful Keanu Douglas on the show yesterday. I'm not sure if you caught it. She's also an educator. And um, we talked about how historically there are big gaps in American education when it comes to the history that doesn't necessarily reflect so favorably upon them you know we talk about the, the trail of tears and you know even a lot of the stories that you know you're talking about around the civil rights um, movement what do you think as an educator you can do to perhaps change that narrative and what do you think that education in general needs to do to inform them uh, and as a, a teacher and educator it's our job to inform our youth uh, they can make their own judgments and their own, um, you know, instances. Uh, but I, you got to give them all the facts, you know. And I think, especially when I was growing up uh, in Teaneck, uh, New Jersey, in the school systems, even though Teaneck was one of the first uh, towns in New Jersey to be integrated growing up, uh, and that's why my parents moved to Teaneck, New Jersey, back in the '80s. Um, a lot of the historical factors were whitewashed. You know, we didn't see. Uh, people of color in uh, higher instances uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of the historical con historical context. Um, you ask a lot of uh, students now, they only know African Americans up to the point of when they were slaves, right? African Americans mm -hmm. were slaves and then they were freed. All right, well, what happened before they were slaves? You know, I actually had this conversation with my third graders where we had to really go into it that, you know, not everyone was a slave, you know, not all people of color were slaves. And the same thing we were talking about Jacob Lawrence and the Great Migration um, in his series. And, you know, again, talking about how, you know, the slaves were migrating up from the North. Well, the conversation was, well, not everyone was a slave that was coming up to the North to be in uh, New York City during the time period of the Harlem Renaissance, you know? And something that's so simple as that, but it changes the whole outlook of how they see things. Um, so giving them the facts, extremely important, having them make their own decisions, but being allow them to give them the information uh, is critical. Have you had any pushback from the powers that be in uh, education or 
you know, do you get any any kind of um, resistance when you attempt to really ex- enhance that narrative? Uh, there, I, w- I will say, you know, you have to understand the institution that you were in. And so, um, you know, there's certain, uh, certain parts of our history that you need to be careful with when it comes to age. Um, kids will understand certain things of certain age groups. And obviously you want to approach that uh, very carefully when you're introducing knowledge uh, in that respect. Obviously a third grader is going to understand things differently than a eighth grader. So while I'm, you know, trying to, you know, put my teacher hat on and educate them of certain things, you still want to be cautious of the words that you're using, of uh, the imagery that you are, uh, you know, giving them. That's kind of why we look up Jacob Lawrence, because, he, um, you know, he used a lot of astra- abstraction within his work, a lot of colors within his work, but it's still vibrant. Um, uh, you know, we don't necessarily go into certain parts of, of death and, and portrayal, but, um, you know, we definitely want to hit that later on uh, as they go through in terms of the institution. Um, so just being cautious of that is key. One of the great things about uh, Grace Church, um, Grace Church School, is that uh, we really want to, you know, give them the information. We want to give them the facts as they go along from, uh, uh, you know, age group to age group as they go along throughout all the levels so that when they graduate from our high school, that they are prepared to deal with the, you know, real life situations and real world situations and go out there and, you know, make the world a better place. But it's true. We want them to be, you know, a leader. We want them to be, you know, in the know and be able to help others. So, First of all, shout out to the Grace Church School seventh grade uh, studio class, Philip students, for anybody who's joining us this morning. We, we were hoping that we had a couple of students join. Uh, I believe your class was supposed to be at 11.15 or 11.20? 11, 11.25. Uh, so we'll see if anyone came on through. Okay. You can do a pop quiz afterwards and see who was listening. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so you've talked about your interest in in how society, I guess, in general, appropriates history today through things like fashion, media, celebrity. How do you take those uh, into your work and what do you hope that you can convey to, um, to the viewers on, that to- on this particular topic? Yeah, um, it was really, you know, in, in graduate school, well, it started in undergraduate, but I really didn't understand it until graduate school that I was really interested in the notions of celebrity, the celebrity mindset within adolescents and adults. Um, and so my thesis exhibition was entitled uh, Witness, W-I-T-N-E-S, Witness. Um, and that was based on being witness to, uh, well, it was based on the campaign of Nike that they put out of being witness to LeBron James coming straight out of high school and uh, being this amazing basketball player, which he was and is still today. Um, but at that time of which that I was in graduate school, and that was back in uh, 2006 to 2008, uh, we were also witness to the large achievement gaps that were happening in the school systems. And uh, mm-hmm. that, that series is really to highlight that. And so I, got all these one piece deaths that I cut down and actually took to automobile uh, shops to have them painted in automobile colors, uh, like BMW black and stuff like that. Um, I had my artwork, the sheet metal that I was using a plasma cutter to cut out these individuals. Uh, I was taking that to automobile places to have them cut as well. Um, and so the, the idea was that, you know, a lot of, uh, students and, and our youth was all, were, they were only concerned with the uh, short-term goals instead of the long-term goals, right? Uh, they weren't seeing all the work that went involved in, in LeBron James that he went through to get to the point that he could be, you know, this new coming of Kobe or this new coming of MJ um, and why Nike felt the need to back him. Um, they weren't, they, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't really identifying with the fact that for every LeBron, 
there are millions of kids that just don't make it, whether it be through injury or uh, just falling through the cracks or, you know, someone just not believing in their talent. And so they never make it. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. And so the biggest thing for me was that, you know, even though we, you know, kind of glorify this idea of the celebrity figure within our society, um, you know, the shoe's always different on the other foot, you know, not every celebrity, I'm sure, you know, you know, people would tell you this, that, you know, once you get everything you wanted, the money, the house, the cars and everything, you can still feel just as lonely, just as empty. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, I've always tried to still highlight that and talk about that, that if you don't have fulfillment within yourself uh, in terms of what you want to do, all the, the extras, you know, are just going to be extras. It, you know, mm -hmm. all the money in the world, it may, you know, ease some type of pain. But if you have not de dealt with that pain on a spiritual level, you will still, you know, continue to have it. It will be temporary ease, I think. Um, when we, you know, the society that we live in right now, we are bombarded really with imagery that is stylized, um, portrays this ideal lifestyle, um, you know, and to touch on what you said, you know, there's no, really no such thing as an overnight success at anything, right? There's tens of thousands of hours that have gone into, you know, LeBron James getting to where he is, or, you know, an artist who perhaps seemingly has this overnight success there's a lot of failures that come before that what are some of the um i don't want to call them failures but what are some of the challenges that you've had along the way to get to where you are today that perhaps could inspire somebody who is coming through the ranks and is experiencing challenges right now uh yeah um so i'm a scholar athlete um i grew up playing uh, three sports. I, I did um, basketball. I was doing baseball. And I did soccer. I stopped baseball when I got a line drive to my nose and said, that's that. I'm never doing that again. Wow. Um, <laughs> basketball, I, I kept up with and still love, but our basketball team in Teaneck was really, really good. Uh, and I wasn't at the level of that uh, to compete for like championships. So I stopped playing basketball in high school, but soccer always stayed with me. I wound up playing soccer throughout high school. Um, and played at Skidmore College, was recruited to play for them as well. And when I got out, I played semi-pro uh, for a couple of years before I got injured. And I still play today and uh, coach. So I'm coming from a, a mentality of challenge. Um, I've always had this fire underneath me um, to want to excel. Um, and I've always dealt with problems. Uh, I kind of always go back to the, this kind of coaching mentality, this, uh, you know, of dealing with struggle, of dealing with adversity and finding a way to get through it. Uh, it's how I teach today. I teach through problem solving. And so I always give my students problems and have them try to figure out, all right, well, how do I solve this problem in regards to the material that I'm giving them? Um, some of the challenge personally that I've dealt with, I've dealt with racism uh, in college and undergraduate. Um, I've dealt with my mother passing when I got out of graduate school. Um, I've dealt with a father who, uh, very close now, but we weren't as close uh, before my mother had passed. Um, and so we've we've really built a bond over each other. But you know, there was a point in time in my life where I really searched for his acceptance. Um, and I remember in college writing to him and saying, you know, you have a son that is extremely talented uh, in soccer. You know, but you haven't come to one of my games. You know, um, these things are kind of have always stuck with me. Um, I remember asking my mother one time, you know, it, was I good enough to, you know, was my art good enough? You know, a real question because I was at the threshold where I didn't know if I wanted to continue or not. And she said, you know, quite honestly, you know, she she always had her 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 teacher cap on, but she said, yes, you're good enough, but what I think doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if I think you're good enough. The question is, do you think that you are good enough to continue? And that's always stayed with me. And so that's always been a challenge where, you know, I get a rejection letter. Okay, fine. I need to, and that's the only means that I have not sent out uh, enough. I haven't sent out enough, you know, uh, uh, applications. I haven't done enough galleries and shows. I haven't, you know, set myself out to enough residencies that because even if I'm getting, rejected, they're still getting eyes on my work. And when they see my work again, they will recognize me and, and, and know who I am, even though I did not get into the particular programs. 
Um, so, you know, I've, I'm at the point now where I'm a lot wiser and a lot stronger, but I still have that hunger uh, coming straight out of, of undergrad and graduate school. I still have that hunger of trying to make it. I still have that hunger of, of you know, really wanting the right people to see my work, wanting to get my work out into the eyes of, of you know, large collectors, of large galleries, of large, uh, you know, uh, owners, but also into the eyes of the youth coming up where they see this work and uh, it really means something to them also. So, uh, you know, challenges of not having a studio space or so having to create my own studio space in the backyard. Uh, mm -hmm. Challenges of that studio space not having electricity, so having to run an extension cord out in the rain, so that I have a light to work with. You know, like some of that stuff is is it seems like a lot, but in the whole scheme of things, in this marathon, uh, it's nothing, right? So what? Run it out, get it done, right? You're tired? Who cares? Finish the work, right? You want some sleep? That's good. Sleep a little bit later so you can finish this, you know, application out, so you have the possibility of getting in on time. You know. Uh, Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes I cut myself. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, I I don't have the money to you know buy the materials I need. But who cares, right? The work still has to be made. So, figure out a way to get it done. Amazing. So, what is next for you? What are your hopes and aspirations for the next five years artistically? Um, really growing, uh, getting into. Uh, proper residency programs that can help uh, help me in terms of my practice um, and getting to the next level. Uh, traveling a lot more, seeing a lot more work uh, that'll really start to influence me um, as an artist. Um, I, uh, gallery representation, excuse me, um, even though I talk about the other ways around it, um, I definitely want to be involved in that conversation um, especially when it comes to the historical uh, canon of art um, and, uh, you know, be in that process. Um, so that's kind of where I'm kind of gearing towards for the next five years. Uh, major art shows is great. I definitely want it. I want that on the resume. Uh, Miami Art Basel, uh, I've gone for the past two years, but, you know, I want to be on the beach. I want to be in the right places where people really walking by and seeing my work. Um, doing traveling shows all across not only the United States, but taking my work overseas and having them see the work overseas as well. Um, so that's really where I'm, where I'm gearing towards. But within the next uh, year, it's really gonna be about uh, putting out this next series that I'm working on. Uh, it's currently untitled, but uh, it will have its title. Um, and so I've, I've kind of invested really the next year to uh, create, if not seven, or more of these large scale uh, sculptures to uh, really put out into the world. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Philip. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. I think uh, you know we can all agree that Philip is a, a just a, a phenomenal voice in the art world, and you know I'm excited to see you know where you take your career and uh, also you know your journey in as an educator. I'm excited to see you know, where you go with that as well. So let's uh, go over to some questions on Facebook. I think we're gonna cut off on Instagram because we're about to hit that hour mark. Uh, so thank you to everybody on Instagram for tuning in. We appreciate you being here with us today. This was just a trial run. So uh, now we know this works. We will hopefully be here each day at 11 o'clock. Uh, so questions for Philip on Facebook. Now is your chance, folks. Let's just give a big shout out. We've had a really big audience today, which speaks volumes for you, Philip, um, we have the Philip A. Robinson Jr. fan club in the house. Uh, so now is your chance, folks, to ask questions. So we're going to go back and go right back to the beginning here. Okay, so a few comments. Claudia says, great to see you, Phil. Keep pushing the artwork. Okay. Phyllis, great to hear about your process. Uh, Miguel, amazing talent right there, Philip Rob, Philip A. Robinson Jr. Uh, we got a lot, I got a lot of love here this morning. Okay, so let's see if we have any questions. Miguel is my fellow alum from us uh, from uh, Skidmore. Fantastic. Okay, so what is this one right here? 
Diane Lester Robinson Stapleton is enjoying following the process. Yeah, a happy birthday shout out to Di. Her birthday was, uh, uh, yes, uh, was it yesterday or a couple of days ago? Uh, so happy birthday to her. That's awesome. And happy birthday to Suzanne Scott as well. One of our artists is uh, and a dear friend to, to the Conception family is celebrating her birthday today as well. So happy birthday to Suzanne. Uh, we have Shante Stone, uh, such a wonderful person, educator and coach. He shares so much with so many. Thank you for tuning in. Okay. All right, let's see. Any questions, folks? Okay, here we go. Does your work comment on current social or political issues? Yes. Uh, yes, it does. Um, but uh, I would say it's always been ingrained, and no pun intended, uh, ingrained within the, the work. Um, the piece behind me, as you can see, um, kind of really spoke to, or still does, uh, me growing up in the tri-state area where, uh, you know, we would always, in the wintertime, you'd have a pair of Tim's and in the summertime, you know, you switched a pair of Air Force Ones, uh, always having that. But it also spoke to the uh, social, you know, economical class of, you know, um, you know dealing with, um, you know, wealth and, and money, um, growing up either middle class or, or lower um, and looking, you know, looking within to, you know, see if that, you know, that's always been a part of who you are and, and where you're going. Um, but even with that work of what has been can never be undone. I mean, that was to date, that's probably my most, um, most impactful uh, series of works that dealt with uh, social and political issues. Um, yeah, I would say that, that that work probably is the most at this point. Okay, any other questions here? Uh, Brian, hey, Brian. Brian was a guest on our show last week who also had a big fan club come in to watch. And you, you guys obviously know each other from, from Jersey City. Um, Brian asks, how does music and the music business overall influence your work and direction? Great question. Uh, shout out to Brian. Brian, good to see you. Great artist, uh, great curator. Uh, and uh, let me put award-winning artist in front of that that uh, that name. Um, so, how does music and the music business overall uh, influence your work and direction? Um, Versus was big for me because you know I listened to all that old school R and B and uh, soul and all that. I mean, I grew up on that, but I listened to that every day. Uh, either in the studio or during my break times or whatever. And so uh, it's always really soaked into my work. Uh, but especially now with this new series that I'm creating, um, I really been trying to see how we can um, almost have the same essence be involved in the process. Um, you know, if I'm listening to songs in the studio, how can the viewer that's seeing these works hear or get the same uh, information from those songs and lyrics and content, those same emotions from seeing the work? Um, the, in regards to the music business, um, I'm really looking at that as almost like the blueprint about how I want to rethink um, this idea of getting visual artists in the forefront of uh, mainstream media. Um, and the, the concept that I'm really looking at now is if, um, if Drake, you know, Frank Ocean, uh, uh, The Weeknd, if they can put out these mixtapes to really, uh, you know, catapult them into stardom, uh, you know, The Weeknd, House of Balloons, Frank Ocean, Nostalgia Ultra, uh, you know, what does that mixtape for artists look like? Right, visual artists. What does that mixtape for us look like? And that's kind of where I'm. I'm looking at it. Like if we're looking at it from a business standpoint of it, even her, you know, H period, E period, R period. Mm -hmm. You know, she came out years before, uh, and no one paid her any mind. It was like she was just a regular artist. But by kind of rebranding herself and uh, you know divulging the audience of her figure, only showing her silhouette and always having glasses on. Um, 
you know, the music spoke for itself, you know, and uh, she was able to rebrand herself. And now, you know, she's a worldwide known icon, you know, so how does that work for the visual artists? And how can, you know, we get collectors and galleries and art fairs, how can we get them interested in us without having to go through the process of rejection, of having doors slammed in our face, of having to do all the legwork of going out there to these spaces, um, you know, because time is valuable, you know, you only have so much time in the day. So how can you really utilize that time to the best of your ability? Hmm. Great answer. How has fashion influenced your upcoming works? Yeah, uh, the series I'm working on now um, is, is really based around this idea of clothing and how clothing makes us feel and how we want to be envisioned or how we want to, uh, to be looked at. Um, I started doing this in undergraduate when I did a piece called Fall and Star, which was a hood sweater uh, that had stars cut out all through in the piece. And it was uh, put onto a, uh, a street sign that said long-term, short-term, and upper-class, lower-class. And all mm -hmm. the cutouts of the stars were strewn around the floor. Um, and the, um, the shoes were a pair of Tims that were up against the street sign. But it was the divulged of the figure. You could only see the, it looked like a figure, but it didn't have the figure in it. So it, mm -hmm. you saw the clothing, but you didn't see the figure. And I've kind of really gone back to that now with this new series um, where I'm looking at uh, different articles of clothing and I want my viewer to be able to insert themselves into the clothing um, by way of stainless steel uh, imagery. So then by you know, having a life scale image of a piece of clothing and then being able to walk up to it and actually insert yourself in the clothing. So that, that's kind of a glimpse into the uh, this new series of works that I'm currently uh, working on. So as of right now, fashion uh, has always been involved in my works, but it's almost at the forefront at this point in time. Fantastic. Okay, a uh, question from Artavia. Uh, what is your favorite piece of art that you've created and why? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Um, I actually get this question a lot, to believe it or not. And my response is always, you know, my favorite piece is the piece I haven't created yet. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm constantly searching and I'm constantly trying to, as a perfectionist, trying to create the next, you know, my next best piece. So once I, you know, and I always tell my students this, that your, you know, your work is never done. You can always go back and rework pieces. So, you know, you may be finished with it for a moment, but you can always go back and rework it. So your work is never complete. Um, but for me, uh, you know, once I put it down, I'm, I'm already thinking about, you know, piece number 10, 11, 12, 13. So uh, at any given time, I'm working on, you know, three to five pieces at a time. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to rethink, revision. Um, and again, going back to that uh, athlete mentality, you know, you're only as good as your last game. So mm -hmm. in this sense, you're only as good as your last piece. So if I've not made improvements, if I've not, you know, stepped it up and taken my piece, the next piece to the next level, then I'm failing. Then, you know, it's not good enough. I need to put that down and go on to the next piece. Great answer to a great question. Uh, Brenda, Greetings, Philip. I've always wondered what happens to an artist's work after the gallery or art show. What ha happens to yours? Do you keep past works in view? Yeah, it's a good, great question. Um, so for a lot of galleries and shows, uh, after the gallery ends, uh, excuse me, after the show ends, the gallery will still keep the work up for mm -hmm. purchase. Um, what they'll tell you and what I've found in my experience is that collectors, even though they may have bought then, uh, they may buy the piece, you know, a couple years from now. Um, uh, you know, they go back to it, they really love it, they see it's still available for purchase, and so they purchase it then. So uh, all the works that have, I have not sold, I always keep up on my website, um, which is philiparobinsonjr.com. Let's uh, get that in the comments, actually. So, Philip, yep, you P -H want L, right? Correct. P-H-I-L-I-P-A Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N-J-R.com. Um, so I always keep those works up for purchase if people are interested in them. Um, 
one of the great things that uh, the Prism Art Show, which is a show, uh, one of the shows down in Miami Art Basel, uh, what they do is they keep the pieces up on their online catalog so that mm -hmm. collectors and buyers, uh, galleries, if they missed it from seeing it then, but still want to go back and envision it or see what it looks like and go back and take a look. Uh, so there's pieces up on that. That's just blackprism.com. Um, so, you know, the, the, the work is still here. Um, I've had, I haven't had the luxury uh, at all times to have a space to store my work, like a storage facility. Um, graciously, my father, uh, who is an electrician, he has allowed me to uh, utilize some of his space uh, to help store my work. So I'm really thankful for that, uh, for him. Uh, otherwise, my wife would still be hitting me on my side, talking about move my pieces because they're <laughs> taking up space. And right now, my daughter uh, is the priority. So. Mm -hmm. You know, she, I had, I used to have a bunch of my artwork in what is now her, uh, her room. Uh, so, you know, finding space to store works is important. Uh, having works available for collectors and uh, galleries to come and see physical works is always important. So, um, you know, keeping that in mind. Wonderful. Okay. So Jay, in addition to the many lessons you've taught your students, K-12, as well as adults, do you have any tips for leading process-focused art for the early elementary age? Very good, interesting question. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so what I've been testing out over the past couple of years is if I give a lesson in, let's say, uh, in perspective, right? So I, I've started off my perspective in seventh and eighth grade, um, where we learn how to do one and two point perspective. And then eventually they take that knowledge and we take a picture of either Grace Church, the actual church, um, or an area around the school or outside. And we draw that on a piece of wood and then we burn that into the wood by using wood burners, wood burning tools. Uh, and then they learn how to shade and what is a gradient and how to create a, uh, you know, this, this relief sculpture by using only wood and a wood burning tool. Now, what I've been trying to do through that is if I've taught perspective to my uh, seventh and eighth graders, then the next year I try to teach it to the grade that's below. So, this idea that eventually, you know, the same lessons, even tailored to the group, can be taught to, you know, earlier and earlier and earlier on, uh, the same way that we do with language. You know, we understand that language is taught uh, at an earlier age because they have a better understanding of it, and then you know they can really comprehend it as they get older. Well, I'm kind of taking the same stance as if uh, if you see art and the the mediums as a language then introducing the medium and the concepts to a student earlier on, and then continuing that as they get older um, would help you in terms of really um, developing their idea of like eye to hand coordination and so forth and so on. Um, what I've been trying to uh, kind of dissolve is the vocabulary that I'm getting with some of my students is I can't draw right? Mm. Uh, we see that all throughout K through 12. We see that with adults, they'll tell you off the bat, I can't draw. I can't draw. I, I, you know, um, and so I've tried to really almost take it as a personal uh, endeavor to erase that mindset. <laughs> that mindset. Um, because no, you know, the same thing as anything else, you know, being able to draw and your eye to hand coordination is a learned subject. You know, some people are better than others, but it's something that you have to practice that. I wasn't always good at that. I had to practice and practice and practice to get to the point where I then can almost fool the viewer into making them believe that what they're looking at is an actual representation of what I'm drawing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we do certain, um, like even right now with our third grade, we always start our sessions with some sketches. So we'll do a 30 minute, we'll do a minute, we'll do a minute and a half so that we're getting longer. We're talking about sketching being light, we're talking about contouring. And eventually now, after we've worked together for the past you know, three weeks, right now we're doing uh, six minute sketches. But it took us uh, that time to get to that point where now they feel confident where they're not 
you know, getting frustrated. You don't have anyone throwing their pencils or their paper <laughs> away. Uh, they're all being able to sketch and produce something that they're proud of. And they're all sharing, you know? Um, and so uh, I think if we're able to really give them these, this foundation at an earlier age, then you can start to uh, erase some of the problems that you see later on within the grades. Hmm. That's God's work right there that you're doing. <laughs> Amazing stuff. All right. Well, that is a wrap. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Philip, so much for coming on the show. It's such a pleasure talking to you. And we look forward to, you know, kind of following your journey and uh, keeping up with your progress. So thanks. Thanks so much. Rachel, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, anyone that wants to reach out to me, you can do so via email uh, at sevenoak.pr at gmail.com or via my website. You can email me that as well. Just philiparomsonjr.com. Uh, and stay tuned because we're going to have some real big things coming up within the next couple of months uh, that are going to involve this new series. So I uh, can't wait to, uh, for you to see it. Fantastic. All right, folks, we'll be back tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. We're going to be chatting tomorrow with sculptor Gino Miles. Uh, so I will see you at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Thanks, folks. <laughs>